just one more thing. Sure there. Okay, and we are live. Uh, Sema for Texas, very nice to see you. Thanks for joining us today. Um, is it, remind me, Sema or Sema? Sema. Sema, Sema for Texas, running in Congressional District 2, for those of you who don't know, is the district that wraps around Harris County. We'll talk more about that in a second, but Seema, thanks for joining us. It's very nice to have you here. I am grateful to be here and thank you for having me. Can you tell me a little bit about yourself and a little bit about your campaign? Yes, of course. So my name is Seema Lajevardian. I know it's difficult to pronounce, but it's Lajevardian. I am running to become the first woman representing this district. I am um, an immigrant, mother of two, breast cancer survivor, attorney, um, and I have been, um, really, I am running to recover the health of the, you know, the health of our democracy, the health of this country, and the health of our American dream. Um, public service is something that runs in my family. My grandmother was one of the first women in Congress in Iran way back and really fought to bring women's right to vote when progress just didn't seem possible. And I want to follow in her footsteps. And it may look daunting going after Trump's favorite Texan, but honestly, I've defied the odds all of my life as an immigrant, a woman, and a cancer survivor. Um, I remember as a child, you know, having to leave because of the revolution in Iran and protests going on in the streets and just really being anxious and thinking I have to leave my the only home that I know behind. And I really thought I would give up, but uh, I defied the odds. And then all those years later, I came to this incredible, beautiful country and was able to achieve the American dream with my husband, my two kids and, you know, uh, working and being happy. And then I get my breast cancer news. And I was, again, devastated, so scared, remembering all those hospital visits, uh, you know, pharmacy visits. And again, I thought I would give up, but I defied the odds. And what's going on in this country right now really reminds me a lot of those circumstances. We're living in a nation where hundreds and, and thousands have lost their lives. Millions have lost their jobs. And we have someone like Crenshaw who wants to gut health care for our most vulnerable and is just putting out misinformation out there. We're living in a country where millions are protesting you know, wanting justice and equality. And then we have someone like Crenshaw and our president who wants submission without any kind of progress. And then we're living in a nation that, you know, we may feel that our backs are against the wall and the cards are stacked against us. You know, that beautiful American dream of life, liberty, justice, equality for all is in jeopardy. But I've seen it and I know that together we will, we can, and we must defy the odds. And um, that's I good. Just, and a very positive spin on, on otherwise bleak times. I really like that. And I really appreciate your story in that I think what some people would call a survivor, you're definitely a survivor of breast cancer and other things, but you're definitely a fighter as well. And I think that that fighting spirit is something that Democrats have really been drawn to, especially in this race where a lot of people didn't want to run in this race a couple of years ago. And now come 2020, and there was, uh, it was, it was a very competitive primary. How many people did you, were in the primary? There were three people in the primary. I came in the last, you know, I went, I was senior advisor and very active on Sen Beto's Senate race. And then on, I went on to his presidential race. So I came into this race late uh, on, in December. And what was incredible is that we had 60,000 people who came out in the primary as opposed to 30,000 in 2018. And I won the primary and I'm just, you know, uh, Elisa has endorsed me. I'm just excited to be in this fight together with all of us uh, to unseat Dan Crenshaw. So it's very exciting. And you really have a great story. And if you see me looking down, I do have a few notes that I'm going to refer to throughout this uh, throughout this conversation. Right. So uh, for those who are unfamiliar with you and specifically with your district, Tell us a little bit about this, because we know that one of the big issues in Texas is gerrymandering. And there is no better example of how wild gerrymandering has been in Texas than the second congressional district. 
tell, let us know, is that entirely Harris County or does it bleed into any other counties? And tell us a little bit about what, what that looks like and what it's like traveling around that district. So, so I'll tell you, it, it, it is all in Harris County and it looks like a snake going through Harris County with a dragon head. I, tell, I always tell this to everybody. It is, you know, it, it is so sad because the most important thing about elections is that you want to make sure that people elect their representative and not the other way around. And this is what they've been trying to do by, you know, making this so gerrymandered. But what is really incredible to me is that I've traveled all throughout the district, not just now, you know, for the past several years that I've been involved in this. And especially now talking to people from Kingwood to Rice University, everybody wants the same thing. You know, everybody's worried about healthcare. Everybody wants to make sure that we have real solutions for the flooding that's going on. Everybody wants to make sure that, you know, there is, you know, good, high quality, affordable education. Everybody wants to make sure that, you know, our children going to school are safe from gun violence. So it doesn't matter that it's that gerrymandered because mm -hmm. everybody I've gone through the whole district wants the same thing. And um, that's just, just been really exciting to me. And I see the energy of everyone out there. And I'm here to represent everyone, Republican, Democrat, Independent. And again, everybody wants the same thing. And I think during COVID, which I guess we'll, we'll talk about it later, it's even more important, everybody wanting the same thing. Well, let's transition to COVID because that is the, the, the issue of the day right now, the issue of the year, as it were. And Harris County, of all the places in Texas, really of many places in the country, has been hit so hard. And what is that like on the ground in your area? And what has it been like trying to interpret local directives while getting interference from the state or federal government rather than support? How have you managed to navigate that? I mean, look, the most, the most important thing during this time to me has been to listen to the facts and the doctors. And we started off okay, and then I think that kind of deviated. And I, you know, we had our, we had a town hall last week talking a bunch of doc with a bunch of doctors, and they were saying there was a time where everybody just listened to us. So I think going through this time, everybody just is very anxious and wants to have information, wants to be connected, and wants to know that everybody's feeling the same. We we see high rate of you know. Depression, healthcare is huge right now in everybody's mind again. Uh, people need hope and people need real facts as to, you know, what, you know, we need to have testing. We need to know, you know, that wearing masks is so important. And, you know, someone like Crenshaw has just been saying, you know, deliberate disinformation, saying that we have, you know, masks are not necessary, that, you know, it's all fear mongering. And, you know, the example set is really wrong and holding events when you know you shouldn't do that without mask to me it's just just very reckless behavior so uh, it's very important that we have correct information out there and our elected officials have you know it's a responsibility that we carry i mean and i will carry but you carry as an elected official to make sure you put out the correct information and obviously dan crenshaw has not done that but during our campaign we've been really tr doing a lot of virtual town halls to try to bring as much information as to what's going on. Uh, we, I do a lot of wellness checkups. We try to deliver masks, deliver food, talk to our hospital workers, workers, frontline workers. So we're very active within the community, hearing what, what's needed, what's not e needed. And really, I'm on the phone all the time talking to friends, neighbors, uh, just trying to make sure that everybody knows that we're all in it together. And I have to tell you, the spirit here is incredible. Everybody steps up to help their neighbors. Everybody's there. But again, we need to rely on facts. And that's the most important, the most important thing. And you touched on something, a couple of things really important. One is you talked about relying on facts and the fact that we need leaders who will lead by example. And I, you know, I really like that you talked about masks because it's such a small thing that makes such a big difference. And we've seen, like we, we had this argument over masks for months. People finally came around from the Republican side and we're starting to see the curve go down. And that, that's a good thing. I hope they stick with it. And I love that you're talking about us needing to lead by example, but you talked about something else that's really important. You talked about healthcare and in the environment of coronavirus and COVID-19, you know, healthcare has always been a big issue in Texas because we just have so many people who aren't covered. 
but it's an even bigger issue now. Tell me what you're hearing from your voters on the ground when it comes to access to affordable care and what Republicans have tried to do with it and what Democrats need to do more to, to help with people. I mean, look, we are already one of the least covered states in the nation, as you pointed out. And right now, one in five Texans before didn't have health care. They didn't have insurance. Now it's one in three under 65, which is terrifying to see that. And I always say the number one provider of health care, like mental health care, has been the Harris County Jail all this time. So, right. you know, I'm... I, I'm a strong believer of expanding the affordable uh, health care and open up the enrollment period. There are so many people who have lost their jobs. And I don't think many people know that you have only a window of 60 days to right. apply and to get to do that. And in order to keep the COBRA that they have, it's just too expensive. So I just want to make sure that we also open up a you know, public option for Medicare for everyone and really push our governor and, and the state to allow Medicaid to cover everyone else. And I think during this crisis, it's been even more visible how much it matters, you know, as far as, and it's not just testing, it's just care of everything else. And for me being a cancer survivor, like prescription drug prices, it's, they're just ridiculously high. I've gone through that. And I think we need to negotiate and make sure that our drug prices have negotiated and, you know, Crenshaw, a campaign on bringing down prescription drug prices, was elected, got a lot of pharma money, voted against it, and then scrubbed it, scrubbed it off of his website. So I think it is so important that we, this is my number one concern. I feel that it's everybody's number one concern right now. And it's, it's the thing that we need to deal with right away. Tell me about the demographics of your district. I know that uh, Houston and, and neighboring Fort Bend County and some of the other places are one of the most diverse places in America. I got to imagine that the second district is, is no exception to that. So being in Harris County, it is one of the fastest growing district, the most diverse district. So we have 40% of the uh, the district that is African-American, Asian, and Hispanic, 25% uh Hispanic, about 12% African American, about 8% Asian. And it's been growing more than even two, since 2018. We've had 50,000 new registrants. And uh, as you as you know, like it, we, we've been number one growth everywhere. So uh, you hear different languages everywhere. And absolutely, it is the dynamics have changed. And th this is why we are going to win this also. Yeah, and uh, I think that with an increasingly diverse district that we have to, you know, one of the things I like to say is we have to look like the people we're fighting for. And I think that you touched upon this earlier that uh, you immigrated here from Iran. And, you know, on your website, you mentioned some things about uh, something about revolution. And, uh, you know, I know that that was a pivotal time in your life. How old were you when you uh, when you came over here? I was 12 when I came here. So I was... Uh you know, it was growing up in Iran before the revolution. You know, you grew up with the image of America. My my, my grandmother has a had a secret closet full of ketchup and candy from here. So we all you know thought about this incredible country that you know you have all these you know amazing candy and something called ketchup. And you know, so when the revolution happened, you know, we didn't like. It was very scary times. We didn't know what's going to happen, and mm -hmm. it was such an incredible. Uh, opportunity that we were able to come in this country. You know, we, we, I studied very hard. I tell this story all the time is that English was my fourth language. I watched a lot of Star Wars, uh, mm -hmm. ended up going to law school. And, you know, with, but the opportunities were allowed that for us to, you know, build successful businesses, earn a great education, become involved in the community, you know, have children and really get to that. And I, th this is part of the reason one of the main reasons that I'm running also is that this beacon of hope for immigrants, I just want to make sure that that is available for everybody. And I find that to be at risk right now. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Especially with not only the policies, but even just the tone coming out of Washington right now is, is real problematic. Um, some of the other issues in your race, obviously Texas is an energy state and oil and gas has dominated the energy landscape here for many years. But that's changing and it's changing because not only are consumer demands changing, but 
as we're seeing again in the era of coronavirus, that the demand for oil and gas isn't necessarily the same as it was when we were in an environment where we commuted all the time. So you talk quite a bit about renewable energy. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about what that might look like and, and how you perceive that? I mean, look, climate change is very real for all of us living here. Uh, you know, we've all been flooded. I've swam home God knows how many times. You know, I have so many friends that lost their homes and they're still in the process of having to deal with that. Yeah. I think more than anything, we have to make sure that our infrastructure is ready for the next flood. We make sure that the ship channel is protected. There, there are a lot of things that we still need to do. But, you know, in, in District 2 specifically, we have about 40,000 jobs in the wind energy. You know, wind is number one in Texas. Uh, we are a strong oil and gas uh, city, I mean, state, obviously, but I think we need to move slowly towards renewable energy and we're already a number one leader in wind. We need to push that for also uh, solar energy and really by creating more jobs, which is what we need right now with all the unemployment that's going on. And uh, I think it's important to work with uh, public and private entities to make sure we do create job and have a conversation yeah. and be able to, to achieve that. One of the things that our Senate nominee, MJ Hager, has said in the past is that the world and the economy is moving more towards renewables. And part of us moving that direction is making sure that we stay competitive, right? Like we don't want to stay behind while industries are moving ahead. And I think that that's been critical for Democrats in Texas as well. I want to ask you about a few other things. We've got a question coming in that is going to take us to the horse race of your contest. And I really do want to get into the horse race here because... Uh, the, the DCCC, the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee, recently added you to their red to blue list. That's a pretty big deal. Can you tell us about what how that happened and, and what that means for your campaign? I mean, look, I am, for everyone who knows me, I am relentless. I work very hard. I just, you know, I don't leave any stones unturned. I think you know, they have been looking at this race. I think the dynamics are there for us to win this. Look, Trump uh, won this district by nine points. Cruz won this district by one point, which is just 3,000 votes. Wow. Uh, the district, as we talked about, is extremely diverse. I'm the candidate with the kind of story that can bring out those kind of votes. And I think uh, I've been so involved on the ground with, you know, grassroots leaders and working so much within the community in the past that I think the movement is there and they can see the movement. And I think what, what is so important is that it shows how, it really shows the reality that we're going to unseat uh, Dan Crenshaw and the fact that they're looking into it and helping me with it. It just, I mean, I always knew we're going to do this, but that now I know we have, you know, the, the, the reinforcement, I guess, with us. And I think more than more than having you know the D Triple Suite C with me, I, everybody on the ground for me, right. you know, this is a grassroots movement. This is this is what I did when we were on Beto's race. Is you know what matters the most is for everybody to come out and make this grassroots movement. And and that's what I saw in the primary, and this is what I see now. You know, everybody's fired up. They understand that this is one of the most important races of our lifetimes. And uh, so I'm just really excited about it. It's great. Yeah, and you make a good point because a lot of times national groups do endorse, but we should never forget that this these races, more than anything else, are about the voters. And uh, I think I like to think that the reason they swooped in was because they saw what the voters, how the voters were lining up behind you. It's always nice to know people have got your back. Uh, I have not looked at the fundraising numbers recently, but the last time I checked them, I noticed they were pretty good. Seems like that's a, a strength of yours that's going to help you throughout this campaign. I mean, look, I think more than anything it shows that people believe in this race. People understand that we need leadership that actually cares. And I'm lucky enough to think that they believe that I'm that leadership that I can, that, that will represent the people of this district and will bring on the change and be the face of, you know, what this district looks like. Mm -hmm. And, and because they believe that way, I think I've been lucky that uh, they've supported me and I'm, you know, I'm hoping that that will continue. So I'm excited about it. So one of the questions that have come in, just lay it all out. How do we defeat Dan Crenshaw in November? <laughs> uh, look, 
we defeat Dan Crenshaw by, by really showing up everywhere. I'm showing up, I mean, right now, I mean, virtually showing up everywhere. We, I hold uh, Zoom events, roundtable events with every community all the time. I talk to, uh, you know, grassroots leaders, grass top leaders, just, or, you know, listen to the ground, make sure that everybody comes out. Uh, we make uh, phone calls to everyone. So I need everyone on the ground to come in and make sure we make calls. Uh, we, 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 we've been very, very active calling out all of the disinformation campaign that he's put out. You know, uh, I think continuing like that and asking people to put the messaging out there, uh, we're gonna be very concentrated on putting out mail and advertising, but more than anything, you know, again, it's going back to the grassroots and having the incredible volunteers that I've had and making sure that they continue in, you know, this very district, in, the, in this very diverse district in all the communities and not leave any stones on turn and make sure we reach out, you know, to the young, to the old, to the, you know, everybody. So, and, and I see the excitement and I see that happening. Well, you're running a really strong campaign. And like I said, we've noticed such strong support for you on the ground that uh, uh, I know that it's gonna play out well. Uh, a couple of things I want to add before we start to wrap up. For anybody watching, we are with SEMA for Texas. She is running for Congress in the second congressional district, which is in Harris County, wraps around Harris County. She, you could call it a snake. You could call it a crescent moon, however it is. It's, a, it's an example of gerrymandering, but she's doing a great job in, in that district, and you should look her up. The email address is, uh, sorry, the website address is SEMA for Texas. That's SEMA spelled S-I-M-A. F O R, uh, is it TX or T? Yeah, TX.com. TX. Um, before we get any farther, are there is there anything else you'd like to add before we uh, we we begin to wrap up? I mean, look, I, as I as I was saying, look, I want a Texan where we have high quality, affordable health care for everyone. I want, and as a your congresswoman, I will do that. I want to. Texas, where there's equally equality and justice for everyone. And as your Congresswoman, I will do that. I, we want a Texas that, you know, we have high quality education, that we're not scared for our kids going to school. You know, we want a Texas that we are protected from flooding. And as your Congresswoman, I will do all of that. But I cannot do it alone. But I know together we will defy the odds and really restore that beautiful, make that American dream an American reality. But again, I can't do it alone. And uh, I think now more than ever, we need to come together, you know, listen to the facts uh, and put, put our words behind our, you know, what do you say, put our money behind our words, but really just get into trenches and then help in this campaign. And I know together we will defy the odds. And I'm just so excited to be on with you. Um, and please join the campaign. We will do this. SEMA for Texas at SIMA4TX.com. What a great conversation this has been. And I love that you've really embraced so many issues that people in years past have, you know, been been really a, a bit more careful about talking about. And like issues like health care and immigration and gun violence, they're so important. And as we've learned here in Texas is that you don't have to be so careful about those issues because the thing is, is that progressive issues are mainstream issues in this state and they have overwhelming popularity. And I love that you're embracing them because I know that your voters love it too. Thanks so much for uh, for joining us today. And uh, you've already got a, um, Rashmi Gupta says, go Seema. You've already got a cheerleading fan going on in the Thank chat. You. Great. <laughs> so, Thank you so much. Uh, we love having you. On it. Excited to do more of these together. Yeah, likewise. And uh, I'm sure we'll be seeing you again at, between now and November. And best of luck uh, between now and then. Absolutely. Thanks so much. Have a great yeah. time. Stay safe. Mask up. Thank you. Yeah, that's right. Mask up. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Bye. Bye.